Sunday School, Sunday School. This is Lisa Cash, and I am here representing Mount Sinai Baptist Church in Rockingham, North Carolina. Our pastor there is the Reverend D.R. Bennett. Now, Sherman Cash, my husband, is usually here with me, but he is on spring break. But don't be discouraged. We have a fabulous lesson for Sunday School today. It is called Prophet of Conquest. Prophet of Conquest. Before we get started, we will consult the Lord with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity. We come to you recognizing you as the Most High God. We come to you in the name of Jesus, asking you, Holy Spirit, to do what only you can do. Open our eyes and ears to hear and receive what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, so the scripture for today is coming from Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Then Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, 15, 16, and 20. I will read those for, for your hearing from the NIV version now. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times. When the priests, with the priests blowing the trumpets, when you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. Amen. This lesson is looking at Joshua and how he was leading the people to be victorious. Our goal for this lesson is to see the importance of a leader who follows the word of God. So just for some context, Joshua, if you all remember, Uh, We started hearing about him in Exodus when Moses was leading the people in the wilderness. Joshua proved himself to be a faithful um, man of God. He, He was faithful to Moses and he believed everything that God said through Moses. Um, And at this point in the history of the Israelites, Moses has gone on. And Joshua has accepted that mantle. Now, Moses was known to be a prophet of the Lord. He also led the Israelites in certain battles. 
Joshua is really more known as a military strategist as he is leading the people in the promised land to take over the land that God promised to the Israelites. But as we will see, as we go into these verses, Joshua was also a prophet in the fact that he heard from the Lord and he told the people what the Lord said. Um, and this is, you'll see some, some more similarities between how God dealt with Moses and how God dealt with Joshua. This story is about when the Israelites took over the city of Jericho. And we get to see God working in a way that he had not worked up until this point that was amazing and incredible. Okay, let's go into verse 13, which says, Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? All right, so Joshua is near Jericho. So Jericho was not too far from the Jordan River. And, you know, as I said, we were looking at some similarities between Joshua and Moses. We know that Moses used his staff and the word of God to part the Red Sea so that the children of Israel could walk through on dry ground. Well, Joshua had the similar experience with the Jordan River. They didn't have Pharaoh and everybody chasing them, but instead of going around, Joshua was able to use the word of God and the waters of the Jordan spread so that the Israelites could walk through on dry ground. Well, this place was not too far from Jericho. Um, it says about 10 miles from Jericho. And as he, Joshua is trying to understand what he's supposed to do next, he looks up and he sees this military man. He's got a sword drawn and Joshua goes up to him and asks him, whose side are you on? Now this tells us a few things about Joshua. Joshua had to have courage to go up to this guy who obviously looked like a soldier because he had a sword. He was a fighting man. His sword was drawn. This man could have been against Joshua, but he went up to him like, if you are against, if you are for our enemies, which means you are against us, I'm going to deal with you right now. So if you recall, when, when Joshua first was given the mantle and it wasn't, they didn't call it the mantle mantle, like Elijah and, and Eli, Elias. But when, after Moses had died and Joshua was the one selected to be in charge, God told him more than once, Joshua be strong and of good courage. And this is an example of Joshua applying that to his life. He went directly up to somebody who could be friend or foe and asked him and was ready to deal with either way. Now let's see what happened next. The next verse 14, the man says, neither, neither he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? So we see a few things here. So this man is now obviously not just a man. He's an angel of the Lord. If he is a commander of the army of the Lord, he's an angel of the Lord. And so he tells Joshua, I'm on neither side. I'm not on your side and I'm not on the enemy's side. I'm on the Lord's side. So we find this interesting. An angel of the Lord is not just assuming that Joshua is for the things of God. How about that? How about that? God sent this angel to deal with Joshua, his servant. And the angel 
tells, you know, says to Joshua, I'm for the Lord. You know, like Joshua, you haven't proven to me yet whose side you're on. So, so that just tells you, even when you, to apply this to our lives, even when we have committed ourselves to serving the Lord, even when we feel like we are sold out in our hearts of hearts, I am for God and that's it. That is as good as your last action, your last deed. As you'll see, when it comes to serving the Lord and being reliable and faithful, it depends on what you do when God tells you to do something from God's perspective of whose side you're on. Because sometimes, you know, we can be all for God and, and go out and do a thing. And then later we can do something that is all about ourselves. You know, it reminds me of um, when the prophet Elijah had to come up against all of Jezebel's uh, prophets and magicians. And he stood so mightily for the Lord and, and doing what he, he knew the Lord wanted him to do. And it was outstanding. And then right after that, he started running for his life from Jezebel. So, so you see what I'm saying? We are merely human and our loyalties, our, our motivation and, and all of that, our courage can vary at times. But now when this man, this, now we're looking at Joshua. So when the angel identifies himself as a commander of the army of the Lord, what does Joshua do? He immediately bows down and says, I am your servant. Tell me what the Lord has to say. Now, okay, let me first say, Joshua was, Joshua was eagerly awaiting what the Lord had to say. So soon as this vessel comes and identifies himself as coming from the Lord, Joshua immediately bows down and let me hear what the Lord has to say. Now, because he bows down, this does not mean that he is worshiping the angel. What he is doing is recognizing. You know how we say you give honor where honor is due. This one has been sent to him from the Lord. And he says, I am a commander in the army of the Lord. As one soldier to another, Joshua recognizes you need respect and honor from me because you have been given the job of giving the word of the Lord to me. So he bows down. So he's not disrespecting God by worshiping an angel. He's bowing down to actually honor God. I'm honoring God. I'm honoring the vessel that you sent. I'm honoring the man that you sent to tell me what you have to say. So let's, let's park right there for a little bit. How many of us know when we have really gotten a word from the Lord sent to us through another one of his servants? Sometimes it's your pastor. Sometimes it might be another person, okay, where you realize your spirit recognizes that that word that you got was for you and it was from the Lord. How many of us give the respect and honor that anyone deserves who is given a word from the Lord to that person? It's just a thought. It's just a thought. The point is that as a servant of the Lord and anybody who considers themselves saved, a Christian, a disciple of the most high God of Jesus Christ is a servant of the Lord. That one servant should be able to recognize a messenger of the Lord as a servant of the Lord. And anyone who has been given the opportunity to share something that God said with another person 
should be honored, not worshiped, not taking the place of God. So, you know, there, there, there are prophets that really can tell you what God is saying about this situation in your life because they have the spiritual gift of prophecy. That prophet or prophetess deserves honor and respect but not worship. They don't take the place of God. They just carry the word of God. Okay, let's go on to the next verse. The next verse is 15. The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, you all know this is almost exactly what happened to Moses at the burning bush. And Moses at the burning bush, if you all remember, that is where he first got called to serve the Lord. He, the, his attention was drawn to the bush that was burning, but wasn't getting, getting burnt up. And when he got close enough, he heard the voice saying, take off your shoes or your sandals for the ground that you are standing on is holy. So this is exactly what this messenger of God is saying right here where I am giving you what thus says the Lord. I am about to give you the command straight from God to you. This is holy ground. This is holy ground. So take off your shoes out of respect for that. Oh my goodness. As I was reading this and, and studying, I, the question came to my mind, where is holy ground now? Where do we as the church today, the kingdom of God, where do we consider holy ground? You know, there was a time when the church sanctuary was holy ground. There was a time when maybe the sanctuary wasn't holy ground, but the pulpit and everything around the pulpit was holy ground. I think the Catholics have, have definitely have designated areas for holy ground, but as we have gotten much more comfortable coming as we are, you know, come as you are, what does that mean? That means um, in, in today's language, that means you don't have to wear fancy clothes. You don't have to really comb your hair right or anything. Come as you are. We are not going to discriminate on you by what you wear or how you look. But when Jesus said, come as you are, he meant don't wait to get saved before you come to church. Don't wait to get saved before you come to me. When Jesus said, come as you are, he said, come here with your sinful self and, and accept this gift that I have of salvation, which will clean you up. So all I'm saying is some, sometimes as we get more relaxed in our approach to worship and our approach to coming to God, we can forget that God considers the place where he speaks to you as holy ground. Think about it, church. Think about it. All right, so let's go to the next verse, which is Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Now those of you all who know, because this reading doesn't... Um, cover when the spies that Joshua sent into uh, Jericho went and uh, talked to the prostitute Rahab. And Rahab told them that she wanted to be on their side. And she told them that all of the city was afraid of them because of their numbers, because they had heard the stories about how God was with them and was working for them. They heard about them um, coming through the Jordan on dry ground. They heard about some victories that they had had uh, against kings that they thought were powerful. So Jericho was shut up, barred up, closed up, because they knew these Israelites were coming. Can we think about walls, protective walls that we have 
around our church, around ourselves, around our own hearts. Some of you all are saying, what protective walls around our church? Are you talking about the walls that, that the church is built? No, I'm talking about the walls that let certain people know that they're not really welcome in your church. The walls that let people know without reading any rules or whatever that this is not accepted here. You won't be able to come in with that kind of behavior. You won't be able to come in with those kind of songs, those kind of words. You, you, you all get what I'm saying. A wall helps you to not let what you want in. But then there are times like this when, when the wall also wouldn't let you out. So there, there, there are benefits to a wall. And there are also downfalls to having a wall. And we do have walls around our churches. Some of us have walls around our families. And others have walls around our personalities and our hearts. You are, have you ever met somebody who smiles at you so nicely and speaks, but Sunday after Sunday, you, you speak to the person and they seem so friendly, but when you look back, it's been three months, it's been six months, it's been nine months, you don't know that person any more than the first time they greeted you. That is a person that has some walls up. Joshua chapter 6 verse 2 says, Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and fighting men. Oh, this is good news for Joshua. Joshua is expecting a war plan, a plan of battle. God is going to tell me exactly how to do this thing. And before God tells him how to do it, he lets him know it's already won. The victory is already yours. Now, that's good news, isn't it? Now, some of you all know, if you have read the Bible to the end, that the victory is yours for every born again, bought by the blood of Jesus saint, who is hearing or seeing these words today. The victory is already yours. Jesus already won it for you. He's already gone back to prepare a place for you. But let's get back to Joshua. Joshua is hearing that the victory is already won. Now, some of us, if we hear the victory is already won, we might just tune out. We have such a praise party that we are not even interested in anything that's going to come after that. But Joshua is a wise servant of the Lord. And so he is listening to the whole story. He hears that the victory is already won. The, 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 Jericho has already been given exactly the way God wants it to happen. But he's got to listen for what God expects of him, even though it's already won. So here we are in verse number three. God starts giving the instructions on how he's going to win this, how he's already won this for them. Now, before we go into verse three, I do want to back up a little bit because it says, then the Lord says to Joshua, in the previous verses, the Lord was speaking through his messenger, through the commander of the army. Now we see that it says the Lord said to Joshua, meaning God was talking to Joshua himself without an in intercessor. This reminds you of how God dealt with Moses. Now, when we look at this closely, what I want you to pick up, what I want all of us to pick up is that when the Joshua encountered the messenger of God, who was another servant of God, just somebody that was higher than him, Joshua gave 
that servant, that messenger, all the respect and honor that was due. Joshua was very appropriate in his reaction to the person or the vessel that God used to send him the message. And in my mind, it doesn't say that in the scripture, but I will say in my sanctified mind that God is showing us if you accept and honor my vessels that I have chosen to give you the word through, to give you my word through. And if you treat them appropriately, then you don't have to worry that I, you will always have to seek somebody else for my word. I will speak to you myself. See what I, God is showing us that if you give honor where honor is due, you get yourself close enough to God that he will speak to you himself. Some of you all are saying, Reverend Cash, Reverend Cash, you know that anybody who is saved can pray and hear from the Lord. That is true. What I am saying is when you give respect and honor where it is due, you may not feel like that vessel is, is somebody, that person that God sent to you and gave you a true word from God, you may not feel like that person is worthy of honor and respect, but God is testing you. God chooses to use whoever he wants to use, however he wants to use them. And if he chooses them, the choice, the test for you is, do you recognize that that word is from God, if so, give honor. And when you do that, God feels like now you are ready to receive what I have directly from me. How about it? How many of us want to hear what God wants us to do directly from God? Okay, now we have to also understand Jericho is part of the promised land. People were already living there and God picked his people, the Israelites, to take over the land of Jericho. The Israelites, the Jew, who, which are the, is the same as saying the Jews, did not do anything to get this favor from God. God chose them and he's gifted them with the promised land. The only conditions that he's ever given them is love me and obey my commands. All right, let's go into verse number three. This is the beginning of the instructions for what Joshua is supposed to tell the people to do in order to um, realize this victory that's already been won. March around the city once with all the armed men and do this for six days. So they, they've been instructed to march around the city with all the armed men once. And they are to do this for six days in a row. Now let's look at this as a battle strategy. The Armed men are to march around the city, city. So we know they can't be too close to the wall because there are people in there. There are people who can fight. They have weapons as well. And, and that's the whole purpose of having a wall. Like it makes a fortress. And so that you can shoot people. I, I guess they're using arrows and spears. Um, over the wall so they can't get in. So the army, Israel's army has to be far enough away that those weapons can't get to them. But now as they are going around Jericho, the, the warriors of Jericho get to see exactly what the Israelites are armed with, what their warriors look like. So they could actually size them up and be prepared to either go out and get them, or if they try to charge in, they can be better prepared for 
what the army of the Israelites can do. So as a war strategy, it doesn't really make sense, does it? But you all know God was trying to show that he is God. He was making it known not only to the Israelites who had had time after time, God had shown him, shown them who he was, who he is, but he's also showing everybody else who he is. So once they win this battle and the only thing they have done is walked around the city, nobody can say it is because the Israelites were so smart and crafty. Even the people of, of Jericho know that, that when, when those walls eventually came down, it was nothing that the Israelites did. It was God himself. Verse four says, have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. These are very specific instructions. And I know what really is just screaming out to me is all the sevens. Seven priests with seven trumpets on the seventh day, marching around the city seven times. So what is this number seven? The, this, this scripture doesn't say, but um, through studying, seven is a number of perfection and completion. Um, some some uh, references say it's the number of God, but we're looking at it. We're just noticing there are a lot of sevens. So completion, perfection, the number of God. We know God finished creation in six days and rested on the seventh, seventh because it was complete. So the point is these were specific instructions and obedience is what is required for them to realize or have the manifestation of the victory that God has already told them that they will have. Now, before we get into when they, when they blew the trumpets, I want you all to think about the circles that they are walking in. They're walking in circles and walking in circles and walking in circles. And, and um, not the verses that we read today, but the verses in between say that when they were walking around one time for the six days, they were not saying anything when they were walking around. In fact, they didn't say anything until after that seventh day, the seventh time, and the trumpets blew. And then Joshua told them to shout. So, so then I'm thinking, has, has there ever been a time in your life where you feel like you've been going in circles and you're not going to reach your goal? And, you know, you get to your point, you're not, you don't even know what you're doing. You're not even sure if you're on the path that God set for you. And then eventually you get to the victory or, or the accomplishment that God wanted you to have. You, you think about it. Think about it. Times when you've been frustrated, you're like, I'm having this same conversation. I'm having this same argument. I'm, I'm having this same issue. I feel like I've been turning away from it, but actually I'm going in circles. But you don't, God won't let you stay there. As you get obedient to God, as you get quiet, trying to do what he said and not stray from it, not, not changing the path because of what other people put in your ears, not changing the path because of the distraction that comes to your eye, but just being quiet and following what you know God told you to do. It may seem like you're going in circles, but when you can get to that point where you are really just quiet and paying attention to God, then that's when you get to have your victory. You all see me looking off. I'm looking at Sherman Cash on spring break. Now, I'm going to read verse number five. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up everyone straight in. Now think about that. So 
the wall is going to collapse and the soldiers are already surrounding all sides of, of Jericho. So when the wall collapses at once, all the soldiers can go in and do what they have to do to claim, okay? So this is much better than if you're going in one way through, you know, I don't know, a drawbridge, a door. Uh, um, if, if you're going in that way, you can be crowded. And, you know, the ones that go first, the, uh, the enemy soldiers can get them. You, you see what I'm saying? If you have to jump over the wall to get in there, um, then it's not coordinated. Everybody can't jump over at the same time. So God made it so their complete protection would be, their fortress would be completely demolished at one time. So then it's just like walking in and taking candy from a baby. Look at how God will work things out as we are obedient to what he says. And they were obedient to the word. They did exactly what he said. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a biblical example before I go to a real life example. Remember King Saul. King Saul was the first king of the Israelites. And he comes way after Joshua. But he was given uh, an assignment to do. Wait for Samuel to come and do what the priest is supposed to do. And then go and do, you know, clean out the city completely. And because Saul got impatient and he felt like the people were waiting for him to do something, he did what the priest was supposed to do. And then when he went to um, clear, utterly destroy, that's what God said, utterly destroy, he did not. He saved the king and some things that he thought were valuable. And then he tried to justify it later. And, and Saul actually lost the anointing. And God chose somebody else to be king because he was disobedient. He didn't follow what God said completely. He added some of the things he thought would be right. And that really messed him up. So the point here is obedience. Okay. Now, let's go to Joshua chapter 6. And we're going to read verses 15 and 16. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. What a day, what a day, what a victory. What a victory now. The thing that st stood out the most to me from this scripture is shout because God has given you the city. To me, that is like shout because God has given you the victory. People of God, every time you think about the goodness of our God and the faithfulness of our God and knowing that with, with him, you cannot fail. The victory is has already been won. We should be able to shout at any time. We should be able to shout hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. As the Israelites shouted and, and the wall came tumbling down, they knew and everybody who saw it knew that this victory came from being obedient to the word of the Lord. Now remember the word of the Lord came through the leader that God had chosen. And they, they had to have some trust and respect for Joshua, the leader. And they had to believe that he was hearing from God. And then when they followed those instructions completely, God did what only God could do. And he did it in such a way that nobody could take credit for it. Nobody could give credit to anyone but God. And, and the Israelites didn't realize, but we know because we have the Bible, that the only way that they were going to be able to keep this land that God had given them as a gift was to continue to honor and obey the Lord. 
and, and give God the credit for all of the things that they had been given. See, once Israel, I'll say once the Jews started getting um, comfortable and they started thinking that we have arrived and because we are so good, God chose us. And because we are who we are, we have the land of milk and honey. That's when they started getting distracted and, and, and more disobedient and rebellious. We have the advantage that we have this history. We have this history. So as servants of the Lord, Christians, servants of the Lord, people, disciples, people who are trying to walk like Christ and, 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 honor God and, and be good citizens of the kingdom of, of God, we as servants have to realize the same thing. I'm a servant of the Lord. I am saved. And when I say a servant of the Lord, that's because I'm saved. I am saved by his grace. That's it. Not, not my goodness, not the good works that I did, but by his grace. And so every, every good thing, Every good and perfect gift comes from above. And as long as I keep it in my mind, as long as you keep it in your mind and your heart, that every accomplishment that I make is through the grace of God and he gets the glory for it. Then we don't have to worry that we are stepping outside of his will, not giving him respect and honor where it's due and we can stay right under the, the beautiful umbrella of his grace and goodness. Now, you know we stray and we make mistakes, but he's also given us repentance, right? So that we are right back where we're supposed to be. Verse 20, the final verse for this lesson. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, and everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. Oh, my goodness. Victory, victory follows obedience to God. Victory follows obedience to God. You all, God talks to us in so many ways. He talks to you through your spiritual leaders. He talks to you through his word. He talks to you through peers, people who are not your leaders, but they are equal to you. He talks to you just when you look at nature. God gives you common sense. And if you're saved, he gave you his Holy Spirit and he is always talking to you, maybe not about your future, but he's always talking to you about right now. Every time you have a question, every time you come to, am I going to do right or wrong? Am I going to say the right thing or am I going to say the wrong thing? God is always talking to you to lead you in the right direction. Why? Because he wants you saved. Why? Because he wants you with him. He wants you to reap the, he wants you to reap the benefits of, of walking in his, under his covering as uh, Psalm 91 says, under his wing, right? We serve a good God. We serve a good God who doesn't want any of us to go to hell. So he offers us salvation and he continues to talk to us, lead us, and guide us is our job to be obedient because the victory has already been given. God's word for God's people is close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus Christ and his blood that cleanses us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to be obedient and trust you and the leaders and the messengers that you send us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen.